Welcome to Blue Oaks. My name is Kylie and I am so excited to be worshiping with you today. Time for a little announcement and listen carefully because this isn't just an announcement, but it's an invitation. Did you know that nationally one in eight people face hunger? And in urban areas like Oakland and San Francisco, that number is actually closer to one in four. Did you know that one third of the homeless population are families with kids? Sometimes I'm surprised and honestly a little embarrassed to say I didn't know stats like that. We all know and see the reality of homelessness, but sometimes it's easy to pass over. That's why I love that Blue Oaks focuses on and partners with organizations that are focused on homelessness in our area. One of those groups is an organization called City Team, and we are partnering with them in a tangible way this month. City Team is based in Oakland and helps people experiencing homelessness, poverty, hunger, and addiction by offering services, including things like help with food and shelter, along with educational and job training. On Sunday, September 18th, immediately following service, we will be making bagged lunches out in the courtyard. These meals will benefit the men living in the residential program, as well as distributed to local homeless communities. We have something planned for all ages, from kids in the nursery all the way up. So mark your calendars, and let's respond to God's call to take care of those around us in our community. Let's start worshiping this morning with some songs. between us by the cross you came and broke them down you broke them down there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out from the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive Your love is
All right, to start this series today, I wanna to ask you a question. Uh, what's the number one thing a woman looks for in a man? What do you think is number one? Maybe your first thought was money. Uh, money is not the number one thing a woman looks for in a man. Uh, but given our society, it's not a surprise if you think that. Uh, according to what I read recently, uh, the answer is actually confidence. What a woman looks for most in a man is confidence. I mean, if you think about it, when someone is living with authentic confidence, when they look you right in the eye when they're talking to you, uh, when they have a conviction that they can handle whatever life throws at them, when they're willing to take risks, you know, when they're willing to take on challenges, when they talk to you, you don't have to guess what they really think. They just speak the truth, but they do it in a gracious way. I mean, right now, if this is you, you're sitting up, your shoulders are back, your head is high, you're ready for life. I mean, who doesn't wanna be around that? On the other hand, when someone is living where their confidence has gotten beaten out of them, when the evil one whispers to you, you can't do this, you can't make it, you don't have what it takes. I mean, it makes you less joyful. It actually makes you less generous. It kind of robs you of life. It makes everything harder. It's harder to do a job interview. It's harder to ask someone out on a date. It's harder to take a test. It's harder to perform well at work. Now, a natural question is, where can I get confidence? I mean, because we'd all rather live with confidence. I was thinking this week, maybe the person who has more grounds for confidence, humanly speaking, than anyone else would be this guy right here, Tom Brady. Do you know this guy? I mean, this year at the age of 45, Tom Brady was voted the number one player on the NFL's top 100 list. Above Aaron Donald, above Aaron Rodgers, above Cooper Cup. I mean, he's widely regarded as the greatest quarterback of all time. He won seven Super Bowls, five Super Bowl MVPs, the most by any player in the NFL. He's just ridiculously good looking. I mean, he has great hair, incredible smile. He's amazingly talented. He's married to a supermodel for crying out loud. I mean, he's famous all around the world. He has a gazillion dollars. So humanly speaking, if you wanna live always confident, uh, just be born Tom Brady, right? Just be born with athletic ability that's incredible, amazing leadership gifts, win seven Super Bowls, marry a supermodel, have great hair, great teeth, and be a world famous gazillionaire. <laughs> All right, so uh, you're not gonna be born Tom Brady. But there's another way if you're interested in confidence. The Apostle Paul made what I submit might be the most staggering claim about confident living that has ever been spoken by any member of the human race. This is what Paul said. Think about this. He wrote this to the church at Corinth. Therefore, we are always confident now, Paul just didn't just throw words around loosely. I mean, think about this. What would it mean to be always confident? Good day, bad day, you know, good mood, bad mood, difficult task, hard circumstances, always confident. Here's the thing about Paul. He was no Tom Brady. Uh, we don't know for sure what he looked like, but the oldest description of Paul is he was short, bald, and had a, had a hook nose. Uh, he didn't have a lot of money. Uh, he actually had no money. Uh, he wasn't famous. Uh, he was kind of infamous. Uh, he was in prison. Uh, he wasn't married to a supermodel or a trophy wife. He wasn't married at all. Here's the thing about Paul. He was confident, but he wasn't self-confident. You know, we live in the Bay Area and a lot of people live with confidence, like to believe in yourself, to be confident in yourself. I mean, that's like the Holy Grail. But with Paul, he had enormous confidence, but it wasn't in himself, it was in God. Paul actually put it like this, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Like how weird is that? When I am weak, really? I mean, this really gets into profound dynamics about human life. A guy named Andy Crouch has written a little book called Strong and Weak. He, knows, he talks about how we tend to think of weakness and strength as a uh, like a continuum where you either have one or you have the other. 
he talks about two dynamics, vulnerability and authority, and how we think you're either one or the other. You're either vulnerable or you have authority. But then he says, we ought to think about it as two continuums. You have either high or low authority, and you can be either high or low vulnerability. And when you look at the Bible, it's very interesting because the writers of scripture say God made us to have an enormous amount of authority. Like when God created human beings, he said that he made us in his image. God actually said to human beings, I want you to exercise dominion. I want you to reign for good powerfully over the earth, like a, a queen, like a king, like real high in authority. And then when it comes to vulnerability, he also made human beings to be very vulnerable. The writer of Genesis said, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Uh, naked is a word about vulnerability. We say in our world, you know, uh, I f if, I, if we say I feel vulnerable, it's like we're saying I feel naked or I feel so exposed. Well, God made us to be high in authority, but also to be high in vulnerability. You know, when the greatest human being who ever lived, Jesus, came, he was very high in authority. He actually said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. At the same time, he was the most vulnerable human being who ever lived. The apostle Paul said he humbled himself, took on the form of a servant, and be became obedient to death, even death on a cross, the humiliating death of a slave. People saw in Jesus more authority than they had ever seen, and they saw vulnerability like they had never seen. He was revealing to us something very deep about the human condition. You know, this book, is uh, his little book, is so brilliant. He says, if you think about it as four quadrants, it's basically describing the different modes of life that we can enter into. If someone has a lot of authority and they feel like they're not vulnerable, well, they move into exploiting or oppressing. Uh, bullies do this. Tyrants do this. We read about this every day in our world. Now, if someone has no authority, but they also don't want to experience vulnerability, well, then they're withdrawing. They'll be withdrawn. They're, uh, they're try to, uh, trying to live in bubble wrap, and a lot of people live there. If someone has a, a very little authority, very little power, little education and resources, but they're extremely vulnerable, when they, ex they would experience suffering. If we experience great authority and great vulnerability, well, that's when we're flourishing. When there's dignity and worth as image bearers of God, uh, we're transparent with each other, we're vulnerable with each other, and we're dependent on God, not on ourselves. And this is what we're gonna look at in this series. And man, this is so needed, I believe, all over the world where everyone wants to have authority, but no one wants to be vulnerable. We're going to go after this by looking at a character in the Bible who wrestled a lot with confidence and authority and vulnerability. And he's a fascinating guy by the name of Jacob. And we're going to go on this journey with him for the next few weeks. And it's going to be, I think, fun and potentially life-changing. Jacob's struggle begins even before he was born. There was kind of a fun beginning to his story. His mom and dad are Isaac and Rebecca, and they were married for 20 years. Uh, they weren't able to have children. And in the ancient world, that's an even bigger deal than it is in our world. So Isaac prayed for 20 years, and finally God moved. Rebecca got pregnant. But her pregnancy was so painful that she didn't think she could stand it. Uh, and this is where the story starts. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob, which could mean the grabber or the deceiver. And the idea here is that his story begins even in the womb. Like way back in the womb, little fetal Jacob looks at little fetal Esau and says, you know, he's closer to the exit than me. He's going to get out first. That will make him the firstborn. That means he'll be the heir. That means he'll get the birthright. That means he'll get the blessing. Uh, he'll get the land and the money and he'll be my dad's favorite and I won't. He'll be number one and I'll always be number two. I can't trust 
mom or the universe or the uterus or whatever's in charge out there to take care of me. So I'm gonna have to look after myself. I'll grab my brother's heel and I'll yank him back in the last minute and I'll get out of the womb and then I'll be number one and I'll be the firstborn. But his plan doesn't work. There's this like travail inside Rebecca, but he doesn't get out first. He fails. He's like a little fetal failure. And that's gonna haunt him his whole life until it ends up saving him. And so they're born. And then the writer goes on. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. So Esau has it. He's like Tom Brady with hair, right? With fur. Uh, Jacob uh, has a lot less testosterone. And then their parents come into play. We're told Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Esau was a hunter. Isaac loved the food that Esau would bring him. <laughs> you know, people are, are such mixed bags. Like you have to know this about the Bible. Uh, someone asked like, why is God so gracious to Jacob in this story when he gets so much wrong? Well, the Bible is not a story about examples of character virtues. It's a story about God working with real, ordinary, mixed up people like you and me. People who don't understand this about the Bible, they never get it. Isaac, on the one hand, is so devoted to God that he prays for 20 years for God to make his wife pregnant. He's so shallow that he plays favorites with his two sons. He loves Esau for one reason, <laughs> because he likes the food that Esau brings him. I mean, he might as well have named him like Outback Steakhouse. That's why he loves him the most. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Why does Rebecca love Jacob? She loves him the most. Why does she love him the most? Again, the Bible is so fascinating, the writer of scripture doesn't tell us. We have to kind of fill in the blanks. Maybe it's because she felt sorry for him. Maybe it's because he was an indoor kid and so he was with her more. Maybe it's because she had problems with Isaac and this was a way of kind of getting back at him. For whatever reason, she loved Jacob, but not Esau. As Jacob grew up, his identity became, I'm not Esau. Like Esau is the strong one. Esau is the hunter. Esau is my dad's favorite. You know, your self is so extremely sensitive to rejection, to not being loved. This is Jacob's identity. I am the one my father doesn't love. And that will wound you right to the core. Like everyone knows that feeling one way or the other. I'm the one my mother doesn't love. I'm the one my husband doesn't love. I'm the one my wife doesn't love. I'm the one my daughter doesn't love. I'm the one my son doesn't love. And we can't bear that. And this all uh, happens inside of us. You know, we think, uh, you know, if I, if I only were Esau, if I only had Esau's body or Esau's wealth or Esau's gifts or Esau's personality, you know, you carry this wound, this scar that you are not meant to carry. Like you were made to be you. If God is ever going to bless you, it's gonna to have to be you, like your body, your circumstances, your age, your situation. That's the only place where God can bless you. And Jacob just thinks, if I were only Esau. All right, we'll look more at this struggle between these two in just a moment. As Matt has been teaching, one question keeps popping up in my brain. Oh, what if Jacob surrendered? What if he didn't define his power or future power by his birth order? What if he wasn't persuaded by his mom? What if he understood the importance of laboring in the field? What if he didn't compare, if he didn't let jealousy fill his heart? And the biggest question I've been asking, what if Jacob chose differently? As I read this story and see Jacob crafting this idea of who he should be through the inputs he's getting around him, I see his desire to be first, to hold power, to be the hunter, to be the favorite. And yet life handed him something different. He wasn't the first, he was born second. He didn't hold the power, he culturally was the tag along. He was not the heir, but the spare. He wasn't a hunter, he was a planter and gleaner and he wasn't the supreme golden child, he was the indoor kid. In my mind, there's something so human and relatable in this moment of Jacob's life. 
He was striving for something and he took his eyes off of God in order to achieve something he thought he was owed or deserved or needed. And rather than confidence, he chose comparison. And that incessant comparison ultimately led him to hurtful choices. I can't remember when it was exactly, but recently in our middle school small group, we were talking about something similar. Our middle schoolers understand that the life around them and the culture they and we live in is anchored in comparison. And we drive our choices and identity by comparing ourselves to others. But the conversation with the middle schoolers let them see and us see that when we place comparison over confidence, we will always lose. There will always be someone in your life who has more of what you want. And there's always someone with less. Jacob's choice to live in the comparison left him wanting and his actions followed and the same happens in our lives. So what would it look like if Jacob chose differently? What would it look like if we did? What does it look like to give up an area of comparison in our life and choose God's confidence instead? To see that even though we may think it's unfair or painful or not what we deserve, that somehow God is at work in our lives and that when we lean into where and what God has for us, that we can find assurance and confidence in God. As Matt continues and as we hear more about Jacob, I encourage you to think about an area in your life where you're rooting in comparison and not confidence a place where your vulnerability and authority may not be balanced. Let this week for all of us be a week of change, a week in which we surrender something back to God and let go of the comparison that is driving us. Let's rejoin Matt and see how Jacob's life played out and what we can learn from that. All right, there's this struggle between Esau and Jacob all throughout their lives, and that is who's going to get the birthright? Who's going to get the blessing? Then when Isaac is an old man, his senses are failing and he's quite feeble and he thinks he might be dying. And he says to Esau, his favorite, like, go kill an animal and make some stew that I love. I'll eat it and then I'll give you the blessing. Now, Rebecca, the mom, hears this. And so she gets her son, Jacob, her favorite, and she tells him what's going on. She says, I'll make some stew like real fast before Esau can get back, you go into your dad and you pretend to be Esau and you'll get the blessing. Like you'll get the good stuff. You grab at it. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him. (laughs) He wouldn't just appear to be, he would actually be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. So he's not concerned about the ethics of this. He just doesn't want to get in trouble. I don't want to have a curse. And Rebecca's response is so interesting. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Now this tells us something about Rebecca. If we go back to those four quadrants, Rebecca has a very high sense of authority, but she doesn't feel vulnerable at all. You know, they lived in a patriarchal world. So Isaac is the dad. He's the one who's supposed to be in charge. But the wife, the woman, actually has a stronger personality. She actually has a more forceful will. Her response to Jacob is, yeah, but I'm kind of worried about your dad. He really scares me. Let the curse fall on me. She'll use her authority and her invulnerability to exploit Isaac, her husband, and Esau, her son. She says to Jacob, just do what I tell you to do. You can pretend, you can put on Esau's clothes and smell just like him. You can put on goat goat skin so that you'll be hairy. You'll feel just like him. You'll talk just like him. You can act just like him. So Jacob goes into his dad. And at this point, Isaac is very feeble and his senses are failing. And it's it's like this scene in a movie. There's this, this amazing drama. Imagine what's going on in Jacob's heart at this moment. He went to his father and said, my father, Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. So Jacob says, I'm your firstborn son, Esau, son number one, the one you love. And it works. He fools his dad. And Jacob learns this little lesson that if you can't get what you want by being who you really are, 
Maybe you can get it by pretending to be who you're not. Maybe if you can't get it by being Jacob, you can get it by being Esau. I was thinking about how often we just pretend. We just pretend to be and think and believe who we're not. I grew up as a kid in church and I just got good at pretending. I would pretend with my parents when I was really little to be smarter than I really was, to be happier than I really was, to be more popular in school than I really was. I'd pretend I was as I was growing up, you know, that I didn't want to drink because, you know, I'm really devoted to God and I wouldn't want to do something like that. When the reality is actually I kind of did. I just didn't want to get caught. Like I was afraid of getting in trouble. I didn't date very much. And so when I was growing up, I would kind of pretend like, you know, I'm kind of above that. You know, I'm just more into getting good grades and sports and stuff like that. I'm not really into girls. In my head, like I was desperate to date a cute girl. I would have sold my grandmother to date a cute girl. And I loved my grandmother. Literally over time, I pretended to agree with people that I didn't agree with. Like, who is this? Like, why would I do that? Why would I try to be someone I'm not? Because I think if it's just me, if I show up and it's just me, like I'm not, I'm not gonna get the good stuff. You see, when Jesus came, all authority and all vulnerability, he had this amazing dynamic where people would just be themselves. They would stop pretending. Tax collectors and Gentiles and prostitutes and lepers, this little community where people would just take off the masks. I mean, he hated it when people pretended. He actually went after it. He called it hypocrisy. He actually coined hypocrisy as we know this word. Jesus was the first one to use it in that way because he hated it when people would use faith or God or religion to make other people pretend to be better than they are, to be someone they're not. You see, for us to be a community where we can just come in and be real, that's the only way to actually have true confidence. But Jacob doesn't do that. What happens is Jacob ends up in quadrant two. His brother Esau says, I'm gonna kill him. And Rebecca hears about that. And she says to Jacob, your brother Esau is a hunter, so you don't stand a chance against him. And so he runs away from home at 40 years old and he had lost everything. And now he is completely vulnerable with no authority. And then it happens. He has a vision. He sees a ladder. Uh, in this story, Jacob is not climbing up to God. Heaven is coming down to Jacob and the angels are gone. There above it stood the Lord and he said, and this is the only time this title is used in all of the Bible. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. Now, of course, Isaac was Jacob's real dad. And so why didn't God just say, I am the God of your father Isaac? Well, Isaac was Esau's dad. Isaac was the father of the one who loved, he loved, Esau. Jacob was not Esau. I think God is saying, I know your situation and I care and I'll be your father and I'll heal you if you let me. Jacob has his first kind of a spiritual awakening. It doesn't solve all of his problems. He still has a lot of mess to work through in this story, but what he says is, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. God has come to me, little Jacob, son number two, the deceiver, the grabber. I can trust God. God will be with me. Think about what God says next to Jacob, the grabber, the deceiver. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. Wherever you are, the most ordinary place could be extraordinary. Not because you're doing something extraordinary, but because God will be with you. He invites Jacob into a life where he could be always confident in the quadrant of flourishing, where he could live with uh, the authority of being an image bearer of God and all the vulnerability of a, defend, a dependent, uh, finite, sinful human being. That's where it becomes possible to live with genuine confidence. And what matters is not how much confidence you have. What matters is what you're putting your confidence in. You see, here's the deal. It's better to have 
little confidence in the right object than massive confidence in the wrong object. It's better, ha better to have little confidence in God than massive confidence in yourself. That's what Paul is writing about. Yourself is gonna be in trouble one day. Yourself is going to take on an enemy that yourself cannot handle. That's the enemy Paul is talking about when he talks about being always confident. This is the verse, Paul says, therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Paul, who is no Tom Brady, says, when the ultimate enemy, when death comes, I will be confident because my confidence is not in myself. I'll tell you something about yourself. No matter how magnificent yourself looks, no matter how educated yourself might be, no matter what kind of great connections yourself has piled up, no matter how impressive a resume yourself has written, the day is going to come when yourself is going to be old and wrinkled and feeble and frail. Death is going to come upon yourself and yourself is not going to beat death. I don't care where yourself has been or how strong it has looked. It doesn't matter how connected you are, how bright you are, how smart you are, how pretty you are. Your confidence is not in anything that you have done. Your confidence is this, our God is able. Our God is able to roll away stones. Our God is able to forgive sins. Our God is able to give grace. Our God is able to replace despair with hope. Our God is able to make weak strong. Our God is able to make the lame leap for joy. Our God is able to bring light into darkness. Our God is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever hope or ask. Our confidence is in the God who is able. That's where our confidence is. That's why Paul says, therefore, we are always confident. So this week, practice confidence in God. When you wake up in the morning, make your first thought, God, this is you and me facing this day together. I look forward to what we're going to accomplish together. When I'm with other people, I'm gonna look them right in the eye and I'm gonna be confident in God. God, I'll be confident that through you, there's something you're going to do. Uh, to care for this person. There's something you're going to do to love this person. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about what I'm gonna say or what I'm gonna do. We're gonna do it together. This week, I won't compare myself to anyone. This week, I'll say what it is that I'm really thinking with great confidence and trust that God is gonna be at work in that. This week, I won't obsess over money. I won't worry about that. It's so interesting with Jacob, when he has this encounter with God, the response is, you know, the last thing that he says is, God, I'm gonna tithe everything I have. Why? Because now I trust God that you are watching out for me. So Jacob the grabber becomes Jacob the giver. This week when you go to school, when you go to work, instead of worrying about all the problems and the stuff that you can't figure out, just think, I will be confident and my confidence is not in me, it's in God and me together that we can handle anything. Always confident, Paul says. All right, I wanna invite you now, uh, wherever you might feel vulnerable, uh, wherever you might feel hurt, wherever you might feel disappointed, I wish I was someone else, wherever you might be tempted to believe you're not loved, God is saying to you right now, I will be with you, like wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, I will love you, I will watch over you. So bring all of your vulnerability to God right now. All right, let me pray for you. God, I pray as we study the life of Jacob over the next few weeks, that you would help us to realize that our confidence is not in ourselves, that true confidence, authentic confidence, will only come in you and what you've done for us. Help us to partner with you in our lives and to have great confidence that we can do anything through Christ who gives us strength. Help us to live with that truth and that reality. God, wherever we are maybe struggling in this area of authority and vulnerability, would you just point it out to us? Help us to see clearly 
the way that you see our lives and help us to make some corrections and move into that flourishing quadrant where we have the authority, all the authority that you've given us, but we are completely vulnerable because we have nothing to hide. God, help us to live that way because you designed us to live that way. And I, I pray that you help us to learn over these next few weeks about how to live this way, the way that you designed us to live. And so I pray that we would get there and it would lead to this confidence in us that just soars. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
pray Every time I face the waves I don't wanna be afraid I don't wanna be afraid I don't wanna face the storm Just because I hear it roar I don't wanna face the storm I don't wanna face the storm Be still, say the word and I will Set my feet upon the sea Until I'm dancing in the deep Please be still, you are here so it is well Even when my eyes can't see I will trust the voice that speaks I'm not gonna be afraid Cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna fear the storm You are greater than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm Rise up, oh heart, believe Let faith rise up in me Let faith rise up, oh heart, believe Let faith rise up in me Let faith rise up
rise up Oh heart, believe Let faith rise up in me Let faith rise up Oh heart, believe Let faith rise up in me Let faith rise up We all know someone who may need to hear this sermon today, who may be struggling with comparison or their life of Jacob. You can click on the On Demand button to share it with them. And if you need prayer or you'd like to partner with us financially, you can find the prayer button and the give button on our website. I hope to see you in person on the 18th, and if you can't be there, well then we'll see you online.